In today's video, we're going to have a look at another one of the renewables, this time offshore wind. It's a webinar that we did um, one or two years ago now, um, so it'll be slightly dated, but uh, I think for anybody new to the whole offshore wind scene, this will be a great introduction. I really wanted to start off by setting a perspective, and this is uh, from a BP statistical review, and you can see the world consumption here on the left. And renewables is that rather slim layer at the top of all the other energy sources that we use worldwide. The slide to the right shows that um, of that thin slither, the orange slither on the, uh, in the left hand graph, um, the makeup is basically broken out as uh, solar wind and other renewable energy. And uh, you can see that wind is the, the largest of those, but uh, that of course is basically for both onshore and offshore wind on a global basis. And um, I think this, the story that we're going to see today is that uh, offshore wind is a very, very new and very fast moving and growing phenomenon. So here is some data on, on where we are. And, and you can see on the graph on the left there, which is showing through time, showing the cumulative installed capacity in gigawatts. And you can see that where we are today is highlighted with the red arrow. And by 2050, we have almost a tenfold increase projected. And projections are kind of updated on an annual basis. And it may be that there's even more to come. On the graph on the, the right, you can see the, the annual deployments, and these are sort of going up and plateauing towards 2050. Now, part of the reason for this is that, the reason for this is that wind farms have a design life of uh, 20 to 25 years. So as you build new wind farms, you're actually decommissioning some of the old wind farms. And so at some point you're, you're kind of, uh, you're running to, uh, to stand still. But in terms of growth, this industry is, has, is really in its infancy and has got huge potential ahead. So why offshore wind energy? Well, onshore wind has been used for a thousand years or more. There are examples in, in the Middle East of some very primitive turbines. But for offshore wind, I kind of picked out just some words. New? Well, offshore wind is actually 30 years old this year. And that's the anniversary of the very first uh, offshore wind farm. Unlimited faster winds. Well, compared with onshore, the winds offshore tend to be faster. They build up a little bit of momentum as they, uh, as they get away. Steadier. Onshore with the mountains and with the forests and the built up areas, there tends to be uh, more turbulence. Whereas as you move offshore, perhaps uh, more laminar flow, more linear, steadier flow. Non-polluting, well, yes, there's certainly no emissions from wind turbines. Plentiful, well, offshore wind is plentiful, but it doesn't blow all the time. And uh, that's often cited and recognized as, as, a, um, as a drawback with offshore wind. But it's, you know, there's a lot of places around the world where if one area is not uh, producing power, other areas will be. Sustainable and clean, I think that speaks for itself. I put in mainly environmentally friendly. There is uh, there is an issue that's again well documented with the uh, the fact that uh, turbine blades blades um, currently can't be uh, recycled, and that that is an issue for for landfill. Huge aerial extent. Well, that's really the offshore seventy one percent of our planet now. You know, it's unlikely we're going to see wind farms in uh, mid oceanic settings, but. Uh, there is a lot of coastline and there's a lot of continental shelf and as we move to, towards floating wind the constraint of water depth is becoming less. More reliable, well a function of the fact that uh, you know it's less gusty, it's more predictable, it, it's more laminar, uh, helps with reliability. And another kind of point is that it, the near shore environment in particular is close to the, the major population centers and industrial centers around the globe. 
Floating wind is just starting. Um, we really can't say very much about it yet, but we can look at the uh, the huge future potential. So one thing that uh, sometimes gets asked with wind energy is, well, what's the what's the ideal number of blades? And you can see here pictures of uh, zero, one, two, and lots of blades. I uh, purposely left out the three blades because we've all seen those. The zero blades, this is an example of one where basically it's the sort of uh, vibration in the wind. There are other schemes where we use 20,000 volts going through thin wires, ionizing the air and, and actually causing the flow of air uh, to increase. And uh, very lots of R&D going on, nothing at scale as yet, but uh, we'll watch to see where that goes in future. A one turbine blade looks a little odd, and you can see here there is a sort of a counterbalance. As those blades get longer, the counterbalance really becomes a limiting factor and, and actually causes drag. Uh, these are unstable systems. The two blade systems are used in a number of places and are still being researched and developed. They are stable, but when the wind direction is changing, um, there is uh, some instability there. We won't talk about the lots, but you know, theoretically, there are, uh, you could have more than more blades than just the three. But for now, three seems to be the most popular number that's been used. Which is the most efficient? Good, good question. As far as I can read, the question hasn't yet been answered. The research is ongoing, and uh, it, it kind of it depends. We do know that the relationship between power and wind speed or wind velocity, it's, it's proportional to the cube of the velocity. So if you double the wind speed, you get eight times as much power. So we would be looking all the time to find the windiest regions on the planet, those with you know average wind speed, the highest average wind speeds for a year. And uh, these would be the ones we use. Now, a little bit at the bottom here, not really going to delve into the, uh, the technicality, but uh, the vertical axis turbines, uh, they're basically, we will see an example of one later, I'll point it out. But uh, they tend to be a, a lower efficiency, but there's been less design work uh, being done on them. The horizontal wind axis, which just most, just about um, the three on the right above are, are all have a horizontal axis. They, the axis points into the wind and um, they're now getting up to uh, almost 50% efficiency. So there is sort of a theoretical limit known as the VETS limit um, where we can get only a maximum of 59% efficiency. So there isn't much room for continued improvement up to that limit. So why do we end up with uh, three-bladed turbines around the world? Well, really, it's a kind of it's a trade-off of cost, efficiency, and complexity. We want a, a turbine and a tower and the nacelle and the rotors that are uh, structurally sound are not going to fall over in a strong wind. The materials um, we we've got choices on, but we try and keep them as light as possible, and we want them strong for uh, as low an overhead. We also want to minimise uh, drag. Manufacturing becomes a, a major issue. We want something that's relatively as simple as possible, as easy to manufacture as we can. Transport, as blades now are getting to be uh, 100 metres in length, uh, that's, a, that's a, a real logistic problem if you've got to transport these to a, to a port to offload on, onto a load onto a ship. Uh, you certainly can't take any tight bends on the way to, uh, to the quay. Installation, major issue. We've got to have very, very tall cranes to uh, to actually install both the tower, uh, the nacelle, and, um, and all the, the uh, associated equipment, and indeed the blades themselves. So that's a major problem. Balance and stability, we've kind of touched on previously. Controlling them, that's also, uh, uh, you know, being able to cut out or to preserve the uh, the wind turbine when the wind is blowing, you know, hurricane force is is something. I threw in here aesthetics. Uh, people apparently prefer three bladed uh, wind turbines, but um, you know, when we're talking about 
a significant distance over the horizon type distances uh, that's less of an issue but near shore perhaps that comes into play and then there are site specific constraints which may be due to uh, local seabed conditions uh, foundations um, and, and basically the whole structural layout and design of, of a site so looking really at where in the world are they? Well, this graph here breaks out in yellow planning um, and in green, you can see both construction and operational. We've put on here demonstrator and decommission projects. The decommission projects tend to be the, the demonstrator projects of old and some of the R&D projects. But I think the main uh, take from this is that the dark green is the operational wind farms that you can see and by far and away the dominant areas are the North Sea and the, the South China Sea. You can see lots of potential in the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean and in, indeed in the Baltic. Um, the Baltic has realized a significant proportion of its potential but uh, we'll see later in, uh, in, in the Atlantic we're still very much in the sort of the, in the planning phase likewise uh, for the Mediterranean. And then other areas are are really kind of you know noticeable by their by their absence. And we're comparing some very very small areas with some huge oceans. Challenges are plenty. We've got the challenges of uh, of nature. The pictures on the right you can find on YouTube. Pictures of of turbines spinning faster and faster and faster. And then as you see on the right hand side, uh, just basically disintegrating and uh, flying away. There's quite a number that you can look at there. But you know the engineering advances. We, we now have T-class or Typhoon grade wind turbines by a number of manufacturers also we've got to we've got to worry about things like ice development um, earthquakes not so much for the turbines particularly if they're floating turbines but for the associated infrastructure the cabling the substations and the uh, and the onshore uh, reception sites. Engineering challenges are plenty, particularly now as, as, as rotor diameters are getting uh, over 200 meters in size. There's lots of stresses involved in the system. There's, there's challenges for anchoring and mooring for more of the, on the floating side and foundation for the fixed offshore wind farms. There's issues associated with onshore grid systems, which were not necessarily built to accommodate a new energy source coming from the, uh, the offshore region, and so um, have to be upgraded to accommodate it. And um, increasingly, we're seeing the uh, integration of projects, the sort of the, the borders or the, the boundaries between hydrogen, CCUS, offshore wind are all kind of, they're all merging into um, integrated systems. Politically, we have uh, potential for, for slippage. Governments have got to get all of the permitting, licensing all in place using uh, various regulators. Subsidies have been very, very useful in the past to actually kick off the industry. So the contract for difference type, sort of a guaranteed price that actually makes it investable for, for companies. We've got also the opportunity for shared transmission systems, possibly a little late for much of the current crop of wind farms in the North Sea, but more likely to see as we move further offshore that there are shared transit transmission systems that will cut costs. And, uh, and we'll be hearing a lot more about uh, the role that uh, the, the governments and, and the strategies and uh, policies that they're going to be adopting as we go through this year and at the end of the day there still has to be the the public acceptance um, because if there are guaranteed prices and subsidies and the costs initially were high but are coming down it is ultimately the end user you and I who have to pay so looking at this map here, uh, just to, uh, to quickly show, I'm not sure if you might see my cursor, but it's, we're looking at the yellow and red are the mean annual wind speeds. They're the highest ones. And you can see that all the way from the Barents Sea, down the Norwegian Sea, through the North Sea, the Baltic, round through the English Channel, in parts on the Atlantic coast, and I, I think Ireland um, and, and uh, the west coast of Scotland, it's not coming up quite as clearly on here, but 
obviously they'd be uh, significant areas. And then throughout the Mediterranean, we really see that there are sort of just some some patchier areas here in southern France and over in the Aegean and uh, Ionian Sea area. So difficult to find online a, uh, a quality map. So this this uh, particular image is very blurred, but uh, I think you can see that you know there's a lot of activity here in the southern North Sea up to uh, Denmark through the Kattegat into the German and Polish sector of the uh, the Baltic, and then on over even to uh, you know Estonia up to Sweden, Finland. And, and now we're looking at, uh, with wind farms uh, off the east coast and indeed uh, west coast. I'll come back to these, these areas marked out in the later slide. This is a better, a clearer map, and this is from Wind Europe, and, and that's showing sort of the current status that, uh, that was actually just as of just a few days ago. And again, you see that really it's this sort of the east coast of the North Sea sorry, the west coast of the North Sea, I suppose, the east coast of the UK, uh, the Irish Sea, um, right across here through Belgium, Netherlands, Germany. Increasingly, France is, is developing here. And we've got, again, the Kattegat and then into the into the Baltic and uh, Sweden. So that's the, the kind of the current status. We have a huge number of different maps of different things. And this is, a, this is an old map showing the sort of the cost per megawatt hour. And again, identifying the areas where it's regarded as uh, having the best potential for cheap energy and indeed they are the areas that are popular. This map basically showing water depth can shows why the development has been particularly in, in this region here. It's because to date there has, a, has been predominantly fixed offshore wind installations so they are uh, tied to the uh, to the seabed um, whereas in future the potential is is in this sort of uh, this light blue area where we uh, start moving into deeper water. Uh, the, the dark blue, I think, is is probably uh, getting remote, but we'll see what's happening in the wet rest of the world. Well, just picking on a few countries, if we look at the United States, huge potential. Here's the eastern seaboard, here's the Pacific coast, and this is Hawaii in this map here. Now, of all these wind farms that are, are all at various stages of uh, conceptual or actual planning, going through environmental assessments, or, there are only two wind farms operative. That's Block Island and this uh, CBOW wind site here. Together, they only amount to uh, just about 50 megawatts of power. So by North Sea standards, it's, it's a relatively small uh, wind farm. Uh, you may have read last week that uh, the Biden administration uh, has basically approved the Vineyard Wind Farm, which will be the next to go ahead. Just quickly looking at uh, Taiwan, lots of developments here in the Formosa Strait, so everything really confined to the to the west side of Taiwan. And on the other side of the straits, uh, on the Chinese side, you can see the, the number of wind farms in China at, at various stages of development. Um, this is, uh, I find, a, just, just a, a snapshot from one of the, the maps that we hold within Trove, and, and it just shows this is the median line here between uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, and you can see that um, there's a great concentration of wind farms right on the median line between the two countries. Um, uh, if anybody uh, has a good explanation for why that is, I'll be very interested to, to learn. So if we now just look at the history of uh, offshore wind, but we'll look at it in, in just three uh, case studies. The first of which is the very first offshore commercial wind farm. It was 1991 that the Vindaby wind farm, pictured here with 11 turbines, uh, started uh, commercial production. Uh, you can see the relative size of the turbines here. Each turbine was about point four or five megawatts. Uh, and you can see relative to the uh, Statue of Liberty, uh, relatively small wind turbines. This is the statistics for it over here, an Orsted project. It, it had ultimately around about five megawatts of, uh, of capacity. It was not only, it was a very successful project, but uh, it was actually decommissioned, very first offshore wind farm to be decommissioned in 2017. So uh, six, uh, a success and a lot of learnings for offshore operations. The, uh, the next one we're going to look at is 17 years forward. And it's actually the one that's, uh, that's local to where we are in Aberdeen. 
and it's the Aberdeen Bay. It's the European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre, which was kind of uh, opened in 2018. Now, I mentioned there that uh, there was a two-year delay, uh, courtesy of President Trump, and the reason being that just off the map to the north here is the Trump International Golf Links at Balmedi, and uh, he certainly objected to the fact that there were going to be all these wind turbines. Now, the wind turbines, I, I kind of will blow those up because it may be very, very hard to see. This was an image that we captured back in 2020, and actually from Google Earth, and it showed 24 turbines. Now, um, you know, I was down at the beach last week, and uh, I can assure you there are only 11 turbines offshore in Aberdeen Bay. So not everything on uh, Google Earth can be believed. Uh, fake news, I think uh, Mr. Trump might say. But you can see that in the uh, period of 17 years, we've gone from sort of 5 megawatts now to 93 megawatts. The size of the turbines has increased. We've gone into deeper water. And, and here we are in terms of the size. You can see that we're... We're now taller than the Statue of Liberty. The last one I'd like to look to is, is, is basically the Dogger Bank, which is, uh, is under construction. Uh, you can see three regions here, the A, B and C projects of, of, of Dogger Bank. Uh, they're going to be tied back here to two converter stations onshore, Teesside and Creekbeck. Um, now the uh, the size of the wind turbines is, is even higher. It's it's getting on for the, the height of the Eiffel Tower. And uh, the, the capacity of this, once it's completed with over 312 megawatt turbines, is going to be 3,600. So we've gone from five to 93 to 3,600. This wind farm alone will supply power for, for up to 6 million UK homes. So scaling up of the projects is very, very significant. From our Trove database, here's the, uh, here is actually the data, and we've plotted on here Vindaby, Aberdeen Bay, and, and Dogger Bank. And this is a plot of, through time, the, the turbine rating. And you can see that initially we started out with very, very small turbines, and they've got increasingly larger and larger and larger with time, and, and no apparent halting to that to that increasing trend. The main reason for that is given on the slide on the right and the turbine rating is really, you can see that as you increase the, the rotor diameter, then the turbine rating is really picking up. Although if there is a curve there, it does look like it's kind of turning over a little bit. What are the technical limits for a turbine rating or, or, or rotor diameter? Well, if anybody knows the answer to that, please put a comment in the, in the chat. Um, likewise, uh, for the wind farms th themselves, you can see that here's the, the year that the wind farms commissioned, and this is going to be here back in 1991. And you can see we're projecting out some to as far as uh, 2030 on this particular slide. And this is uh, the distance offshore, and you can see that there is a trend to go increasingly further offshore. This is 2021 here in the red line, but there's still capacity close to shore. So there will always be an increasing spread where um, some countries and some areas are developing close to shore wind farms and, and other countries are moving further out onto their continental shelf or potentially beyond. In terms of uh, water depth, this is versus distance to shore, as you'd expect, you know, water depth's generally getting deeper as you go further offshore. But this kind of, this line here is sort of marking that we have fixed turbines. So these are turbines that are actually fixed on the on the seabed. Uh, and then above that, we, we start moving into the realm of uh, floating turbines. And in time, this entire quadrant of the graph is, is potentially what will be filled and and we'll be continuing to monitor every development and, and updating the database. So uh, we'll watch this space. If we just kind of look as a case study at the UK, we could have chosen, I think, um, many areas, but the 2030 target, uh, we're currently at around about 10 gigawatts uh, capacity for offshore wind. The, the target is to get to 40 of which uh, one gigawatt is anticipated to be floating wind. We've only really nine years to go to get there. So most of the projects, uh, we know where they are. They're either uh, under construction, 
in operation or, um, or at an advanced level of planning. To get there, we need to add something like a, a thousand more turbines to, to make that number. Where is that going to come to? How are we going to achieve that plan? Well, to date, as you can see here, you know, we favoured the, the shallow waters of the Irish Sea, the Mid North Sea High, and and uh, the Southern North Sea Basin. In time, well, in, in the recent award, uh, an additional eight gigawatt capacity in in the fourth round, with the lease award anticipated in 2022. I think three of these areas, the Irish Sea and the two Southern North Sea areas, um, had had awards, but uh, I, I think the channel area it has was not awarded we look at also to uh, it, offshore whales both in the celtic sea region uh, of pembrokeshire the little small map to the at the bottom and around anglesey to the north particularly uh, windy areas i as i recall so uh, that's going to be an area for potential development and then um, scotland well scotland has been delayed. Uh, there hasn't actually been a lease around in uh, Scotland for about a decade. Um, so these areas in dark blue are going to be uh, put up for leasing. And there looks that there's going to be a significant amount of interest, including a lot of the uh, sort of major oil companies who are migrating to uh, renewables and greener energy. So as I said earlier, capacity is probably, we know the projects are going to deliver the, the 2030 target. Um, we noted earlier that it's probably too late for shared offshore transmission, but uh, in future, that will be the, uh, the way forward to, to uh, manage costs. And floating wind is going to be critical to deliver, certainly beyond the targets beyond this decade. Further enablers of this, well, the free ports, you know, you've got in the Humber and, and plans and many, many ports in and around the North Sea and uh, the UK and, and other areas are looking to upgrade their f facilities. And uh, just share, this is the, the vis vision of the, the port of Cromarty where, you know, they're, they're looking to basically, you know, offshore wind farms with substations feeding back to electrolyzers onshore producing green hydrogen and a whole infrastructure in and around hydrogen transport, rail networks, shipping. So lots and lots of distilleries, lots of opportunities to use the, uh, use the power. So there is a, an increasingly diverse and extensive supply chain and customer base with continued government commitment and, and public approval. It looks like the future for offshore wind is just going to continue growing very, very quickly. Technology, well, floating wind, I just got a series of pictures here that uh, various shapes. This top top left picture shows a, a vertical axis wind turbine, whereas all the others, it's a horizontal axis. So you can see horizontal actually pointing into the wind as opposed to here uh, being perpendicular. We've got all sorts of semi-submersible spars, TLPs and barges that are going to be used. These are uh, examples. This is uh, Fukushima. It, it ran for nine years and I think uh, it's when you actually look at the consortium of companies that are involved in there, just about every major Japanese uh, corporation of any size all uh, collaborating and combining and learning together on that particular project. We've got other examples of uh, high wind in Scotland where there's, uh, there's two floating turbines uh, currently operational um, just offshore Kincardenshire, Kincardenshire and uh, high wind Tampen as well on the way to, to being delivered over in Norway, supplying um, some of the offshore platforms. I threw this slide in. Uh, I found it very, very uh, helpful and the, the first subsea website had a great sort of case study, a step-by-step entry into the floating offshore wind turbine supply chain, which I thought was really very, very useful. So I thought uh, for anybody who's new to the subject, point them at that. Uh, we've got no association whatsoever. Uh, we're, we're not getting anything for it. But uh, so um, if they ask why you came to the site, you could just say, um, oh, we saw it on Trove Renewables web webinar. That would be useful. So just to kind of move on now to look at our database and and this is a, not just a challenge for us but it's a challenge for everybody offshore wind is very fast moving and one of the features is that uh, project names change 
very frequently. And it's very, very difficult sometimes to actually keep up with what the names have changed from and to. Uh, here's an example of, you know, for Hornsey uh, in offshore England, uh, east coast of England, uh, you, you can see these are some of the names that have been associated with it at various stages. And what we do is, uh, one of the first things we do is we, we capture every possible name that it's ever been known by at, at various stages in the uh, in the development, which is, is very, very useful. Incomplete uh, data, well, there is uh, there are lots of discrepancies out on the internet and it's lots of changes are made particularly late in the uh, the design phase where there's equipment upgrades lots of things that we try and uh, mitigate that by by basically checking back regularly and cleaning up and updating the information and showing sometimes that well you know hey it used to be that we're going to be using eight megawatt turbines but now They've, uh, they've switched to fewer 12 megawatt turbines, or as an example. Ultimately, it's only really the as-built spec that, uh, that we were, were looking to capture, uh, and that would be on project completion, when we know what's exactly being put in place. Plans change on a regular basis in wind. Um, there's a fast rate of change, so we have dedicated researchers monitoring worldwide developments. So we've done all the hard graft so that uh, it make it easier for you to actually find your, your way around. Here is an example. This is offshore Germany in the North Sea. And you can see sort of in green here are operating wind farms in various oranges. These are being uh, constructed or, or very close, very late planning phase. Some of these have been cancelled. Some of these um, are at varying stages of planning and then you can see that the, the gaps are basically the sea lanes that are being left for shipping very clearly the wind industry um, in this part of the north sea is using a very significant proportion of the sea area so other users like uh, fishing like military like uh, the oil and gas industry for example you know they these areas will eventually be sterilized for for use by many of the uh, many of those industries so this is quite a commitment and this is a huge area of germany to be looking at but they may be staged they may not all be developed at the same time and, and um, um, some may be repowered others may not but you know here you can start to see this this shared uh, infrastructure here so the, the the cabling is is linking up and you know building out and, and this is the most kind of efficient way to to move forward but it does involve a lot of pre-investment so we follow about 570 assets the number changes um we we kind of um, deliver a product in excel um, we have wind farm descriptions country descriptions technology descriptions we, we are a sort of a wind wiki if you will the map on the right is basically shows uh, that in the the dark blue circles you can see all the wind farms that we have we, we do all the large onshore wind farms in the uk but all the the offshore wind farms now we're not showing the aerial extent of these but just really showing that we these are the ones that we have over and above that we have uh, trove databases that cover all of the oil and gas fields and discoveries in the north sea all the wave and wind projects certainly in the uk and we're moving that to uh, other parts of of uh, mainland europe we've got uh, the geothermal um, which is the subject of next week's webinar um, gas storage, which uh, of which there is a lot in uh, you know, northern Germany and uh, into Holland, lesser so in within the uh, the UK just now, and and of course hydrogen projects which have been identified, and and, and there's many in an ever growing number. And CCUS finally, that's carbon capture and uh, usage and storage. So we have uh, databases covering all of these energy sources. So what does uh, Trove look like? So it's delivered up as a sort of a, a click and a point and click. You know, you just see a topic here, go, and it takes you to the page, and then you'll come back to this page and jump to another area. We have databases, we have dashboards, we have maps. We also have an area where we just cover the reports that come out from from some of these authorities and these are great introductions to uh, uh, to, to wind energy 
uh, showing various studies, all in one place, all at the click of a button away. Uh, we can look at all the wind farms and these dashboards where you can slice and dice these to, to find information. Likewise for, for, for wind turbines. For the, for the assets, here's some examples of the sort of the unstructured data that uh, all the reports and maps and diagrams and pictures for all of these and you can see we've just done them alphabetically here just taken a few from from the from down the alphabet of the 570 to show you that this is a very very rich environment you can see where wind farms are relative to other things wider picture you can see some of the uh, the infrastructure either actual or planned you know we see project write-ups we see descriptions and and this keeps getting added to it's uh, it's updated so that you can see the latest and greatest developments then for countries we we cover uh, 90 countries where we've um, we, we we follow significant wind activity and here you're just seeing a, a few of these they're just showing again that we have the maps showing where the winds are the strength the write-up uh, reviews where they're up to in uh, the government policy and regulation news any any and all information that we find we basically just put in here technology um, over 50 technologies i think we kind of saw some of this when we looked at some of the uh, the, the pictures of the uh, floating uh, wind farms but you can see it's it, there's more than just pictures in here we have uh, write-ups of where they are what they are individual products and uh, how they're how they're developing and this gets updated as well with industry news uh, likewise for the offshore wind knowledge base the key data we've got is for, for each wind farm we've got the capacities the company's location lats and long so it can actually be taken into gis systems and uh, and used that way with uh, other shape files that might be available on wind farms but we will have all the uh, uh, the numerical information associated with the attributes for each wind farm turbine data and a project description typically um, similarly for turbine data we have uh, everything that uh, that you'd expect um, hub height tends to be site specific so um, that's not often quoted and we can kind of wrap this up in uh, in sort of some of our uh, our infographics which you'll see increasingly so this this infographic here is actually for the UK sector of the Irish Sea so you can see 12 operational wind farms 13 in total one planned you can see that the uh, the wind size the wind farm size is basically ranges from 25 turbines up to 160 the total in that in, in this selection 689 this is the capacity the range from the smallest wind farm to the largest the total capacity uh, 3.3.5 gigawatts uh, you can see the year commissioned and so typically these are from 2010 to 2019 you can see the size of the turbines and, and see that many of them are actually have been out for a number of years now and are, um, are sort of smaller than, than what would be shown today the distance to offshore varies uh, that's uh, 6 to 23.5 kilometers offshore uh, the height uh, ranges the tip height the rotor down so all of this stuff and, and the, the range in water depths is given some averages of here so so for any area in, in the world we can uh, we can just basically take a view and look and assess the maturity of it assess the potential in the region so these reports can be done pretty much automatically I thank you very much for your time and I hand back to Rose and we'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you Mike and thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Just a quick reminder of the upcoming webinars. So we have time now for a few questions. The first one is, in your opinion, what is the most exciting area globally for offshore wind development? Well, um, everywhere in the world's got potential. Um, I mean, e even in areas, let's say towards the equator, where the wind doesn't blow quite as hard as it does at uh, higher higher uh, latitudes, um, there's still potential to use smaller turbines. You know, maybe two, three, four megawatt turbines to actually supply 
local demand. So, so there is the potential there. The, the, the challenge is, is is getting the the industry started in the region, and, and certainly in, in places that's required uh, government subsidy and full government support to make it happen. I think the exciting areas, to my mind, the, the North Seas uh, and the Baltic, uh, still continue to look very very exciting. The US is looking like it, it is now engaged and it is going to be a, a, a fantastic growth area but there's pretty much everywhere in the world um, you know the 90 countries that we have and we've looked at they're all to, to at some degree or another they've done the desktop exercises they've done their environmental assessments and they're, they're looking for investors they're looking for, for companies to get in there so there's many many places that are going to be interesting to watch in the years to come Thank you, Mike. The next question is, what factors typically control the cost per megawatt hour? That's not my area of expertise. Uh, I mean, you know, the, uh, the, the, the cost is coming down. The industry could only get going with, with the price guarantees, um, with, uh, you know, to actually anything, any new energy system even if it's uh, hydrogen for for transport for, for cars to build the filling stations to put the pipelines in place uh, everything associated with it it's going to there is going to be an initial investment but for wind certainly in certain parts of the of the world and, and it looks like certainly in the, in the north sea it, it looks like we've crossed that that hurdle now and the the price of electricity from, from wind is, is getting to be very, very comparable with, or competitive rather, uh, with other uh, sources of energy. Absolutely. Next question here is, are there any issues with transportation and or storage of the electricity produced? If there are, what are they? Which method is the most efficient? And is there any other method under development? Yeah, so um, so what are the issues um, with transportation? I mean, uh, the, there is the transporting it to the coast and then actually getting it into the existing grid. That can be a major issue. It's certainly something that's, uh, that has been looked at in, in a lot of uh, detail in places like the eastern seaboard of the US. So there are challenges there and that all has to be designed and, and engineered to, to work. Uh, which method is the most efficient? Um, well, uh, you know, increasingly people are looking to systems like electrolysis where, where when there is uh, an oversupply or an under demand for electricity, the, uh, the power can actually be diverted and used for creating or generating um, green hydrogen, for example. And we'll see more of this in two weeks time when we have our, our hydrogen um, our webinar. But uh, yeah, hydrogen is a, is a good place. Um, electricity, I mean, you know, if you, if you look at batteries, though they hold some potential, scaling them up is, is going to be an enormous challenge. And even some of the greatest battery banks are only good for, a, you know, a, a day or two supply to a, to a small town. You know, we, we've really we've got to we've got to look at scalability of these things and and it could be that hydrogen is the answer or, um, or hydrogen storage various uh, means there's there's lots of challenges out there people are looking at all sorts of, uh, of opportunities and developments and uh, and we capture a lot of those in our uh, energy storage knowledge base we have time now for probably one more question final question is does the system have contact information for individuals, meaning Trove? We do have an offshore wind uh, database, which is, uh, which I think has about 700 companies. And we have uh, not, not so much individuals, but, but uh, contact uh, general emails in there, some telephone numbers, addresses, that sort of thing. Um, it, it's, it's actually a slightly separate prayer. Pro product but um, it really addresses all the operators and much of the supply chain the regulators and is global uh, and is, is growing all the time thank you very much mike and thank you everyone for your questions and such great interaction i think we'll leave it there for now but we hope to see you next week for our geothermal webinar that's excellent thanks very much then
Thanks again. Bye bye. Well, hope you enjoyed our video. Um, there's more in the series, so go to our channel and uh, you'll find there lots of information on oil and gas assets from around the world as well as the renewables. So uh, look forward to seeing you back on our channel soon.